Thank you so much for joining us today on Connect and Collaborate, where we come together each day to introduce you to our network of business and community leaders to discuss important issues that impact business in Colorado and the region. I'm Tammy Schaefer, your on-air producer, and today we're connecting with Rocio, Rocio Perez. She is uh, with the founder of Inventiva. Did I say it right? Yes, Inventiva Consulting. Yes. Inventiva Consulting. And Rocio, we're so excited to have you here with us because you're going to turn the tables a little bit. Yes, I am super excited to be here. It's quite an honor and a privilege to interview entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who are on fire and setting the stage for other entrepreneurs to thrive. Absolutely. So, Rocio, we have Gail Deniger with us, and Gail is the uh, founder of Cap Logistics. Is it 32 years? Uh, 35, getting 35 pretty close years. to 36. Wow. That's a, that's a long time when we hear that a lot of Definitely. startup companies, well, in, in today's day and age, uh, are lucky if they make it 10 years, right? Most definitely. And I, I definitely find that. Should we jump right into questions? Please do. Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Gail, I've been waiting for this day for months. And I'm scared to death. Okay, good, because I am <laughs> okay, super good. excited. I am on fire. I could hardly sleep. And I just want to know, how did you do it, Gail? Because you've built this amazing empire. I want to know how you did it. Casey, okay, so you're talking about, what's this type of learning? Kinesthetic? So is this a kinesthetic question? This is can, not can so I fail? Uh, no, there, there's <laughs> no question that you can fail or not. This is, we're really learning from you. We're here to pick your brain uh, and all those gold nuggets that we're uh, going to take away from you. I'm scared for a reason. I have met my match here today. I'm sorry, go ask the question again. Please, how did you build it? How did you do this? You started this amazing empire. Oh, I don't think it's an empire. Um, I think there's a lot of people who start out, have an idea, and uh, hopefully you can go pull it together before you crash and burn. And I consider the fact that we're still in business to be very, very, very lucky, in addition to maybe doing one or two things right along the way. But you cannot discount luck. Okay. Let me ask you, Gail. Did you have family members, fam success? What do you attribute your success to? Did you grow up with entrepreneurial parents? Where did it come from? No, actually, uh, uh, both Tammy and I grew up on farms in Nebraska. We're actually mm -hmm. cousins. We don't uh, broadcast don't that it. very much. No, neither, well, both, you know what? Neither, this neither is the first time I hear about this, okay? <laughs> See, I told you. We All right, okay. brag about okay. it. Her, we we her, talk uh, about finding some, some gold yeah. nuggets so, here. So, so her, <laughs> father, her father I held in just absolute esteem. He... Uh, was a very friendly person, uh, somebody that everybody liked, and it was real easy to underestimate the entrepreneurial ability of this farmer. Uh, this guy was absolutely incredible, and uh, if you weren't on your toes, uh, you would always be on the losing end of a, of a deal with Virgil. He was incredible. <laughs> My dad was sort of like um, uh, Da Vinci. He was a complete orphan by the time he was five. His dad died when he was four. His mom died when he was five. There was 11 kids. He was the second youngest. And along the way, I think he overcompensated. But this man could paint. He could draw. He could build anything. He would weld. He played every uh, musical instrument there was. He would actually perform at the county fair. Uh, he was the kind of person that if your machinery broke down, you could go bring it over to dad, and he would weld it for you. And, so, you know, just a wonderful soul with a, with a great sense of humor and uh, just poor as a church mouth. But one of the most talented people I ever met. And, and raised a, a large family. He raised seven kids, yeah. right. Which yeah. is really where we come from that's barely average, Tammy. Exactly. Is it really? Yeah. Right. What's the average? What's, what's Seven, the seven's average. There's, you know, okay. 10, 12, 15, 16, 18. Most of my cousins wow. had a good nine to 10 kids in right. their family. So seven was, yeah. Right. right. I, then I must come from a very small family. I have a family of five children. There's five kids, a middle child, only girl. And my son must be like something that never really happens. I only have an <laughs> only child. I have one, one kid. What's going that way? I know. You know it's it, definitely it, that, that it is has, a trend. It has to. That it is has a trend. To. Beautiful. Well, tell me, Gail, falling down, have you ever hit the floor, hit it hard, scrape your knees? 
I, got I, would, up. I wouldn't say every day, but, you know, it has happened from time to time. We have had some things happen that uh, it's been absolutely incredible that we lived through it. Um, one was some litigation that we got involved with, and I figured that our chances of actually prevailing from this were one out of 10,000. I play a little bit of poker. So if you look at the wild World Series of Poker, each person throws in 10 grand. There's about 8,000 people do that. The pot is about $8 million. So we were in a situation where we're probably going to get tagged for 8 to $12 million, and we lived through it. Wow. You by, must be a very good poker player. By, by hard work and, uh, and getting a little bit lucky. And then there's another company that we started uh, in aviation. I figured the chance of us pulling that one off is about one out of 100, but it looks like we're going to do it. So, uh, Congratulations. Yeah, I think you have, to, uh, you have to be persistent. You have to be stubborn. Um, and, and you can't quit. I mean, I see these things right now where you want to fail fast. I'm not quite so sure that. I'm not sure if you're failing fast. That must not be too much of a project. Because it takes a long time to make something successful. And I don't think you can tell after 90 days or 180 days right. that, that you should pull the plug on something. Especially when you're working with the most common thing right now, the business canvas, right? Mm -hmm. People are coming in, how do, how do I start? How do I launch? And in reality, it's not until you're in the market that you find out whether you're going to be successful or not. And you speak of perseverance. What did you have to persevere through specifically that has allowed you your success, that has granted you your success today? I, I, uh, I'm really uncomfortable with you know, success. I think maybe attribute it once again to luck. Okay, Okay. Luck. So, Tell me about luck. Um, I'm not sure there's something like good karma, and I'm not sure why uh, the way that I am and kind of the rogue that I am, why I should get good karma. But I've always had good karma. Even when you have the things that should kill you or even the things that are highly uncomfortable, there's all lessons in these things. And if you can just get through it, then it's pretty good on the other side, even though it's a little rough as you're going through it. So I still, once again, I attribute it to luck. You know, we've, we've had things, you know, we have airplanes. You know, sometimes one part breaking or not breaking. You know, we do a lot of driving. So, you know, instead of turning right, maybe you turn left. Or maybe you're one or two seconds earlier or one or two seconds late. I think there's all kinds of things in our lives that are just the teeny tiniest little something that makes all the difference. Now, would you say, Gail, <clears throat> in order for anyone to be successful, that individual must have an amazing support system because you cannot do it alone. That I agree. And, and that whole idea, I built this alone, mm. is unrealistic. Whether it is your wife or your children or somebody who you're doing it for that supports you along the way. Tell me, who is that support system for you? Almost everybody but me. <laughs> Tell me about that because sometimes we see that. Everybody sees our potential except for ourselves. Would mm. you agree to a certain degree? Well, I think that... Once again, I grew up on a farm. My dad liked nature, and so I really like using metaphors from nature. And I like the little things that are small that survived a couple hundred million years. So, you know, it's, you know, what's around where there's still bugs and there's still cockroaches. You don't have a cockroach on your wall, do you? No, but uh, we go down to Florida and they've got everything known to man down there. But that's <laughs> right. a whole other issue. That's another but, conversation. But, the, the five metaphors I like to play with is a spider because they have design and infrastructure and uh, they've got radii and rings and hubs. So they're very good as far as learning about design. Then I like the honeybee because uh, they gather resources. Uh, they're very good as far as communication. They also have a natural uh, division of labor, almost like a chessboard would. And then I like uh, the dragonfly because it's got the compound eye, so it reminds me to go look ahead, look back, look at things from different points of view. Those three things I'm really, really, really good at. Uh, I am uh, left-handed, I'm right-brained, and so the characteristics that I have are very much of a right-brained person. Where the work actually comes in and where Tammy and everybody else comes in mm -hmm. is executing. So how do you take these things and actually turn them into money and then how do you keep these things going? 
So to me, uh, making something grow is transformation. So you've got butterflies that go from an egg to a worm to a pupa. So that's a transformation metaphor. Then the last one, you know, if you survive the day, if you survive the week, if you survive the month or the year, whatever, then that resembles the Nautilus shell, which keeps making concentric circles. And so, uh, really, that's that's how it works. I'm very uh, visual, uh, very good as far as strategy, and very good as far as you know all the different things that people emphasize. And really, the payment hits the road once you start selling, once you start marketing, once you take care of the customer. Mm -hmm. So there's two distinct parts. So we're really lucky that we have people that get things done. So where's the book, Gail? Well. <laughs> oh, well, the book, actually, I've written round one of this, and it was approved by McGraw-Hill to actually be published. However, I never followed up because I wanted to go change it. Okay. But I will All sometime. Right. All right. When the time is ready. When the time is ready. Now, let's talk about rituals because it is in the rituals. It is the small things that we do every day that lead to success. Mm -hmm. You can't jump out of a window and you have a thousand feet to go with a one foot right. rope, right? It's tying that That's next rope. That's how you hang yourself, right? Right. That's how you hang yourself. <laughs> right. I mean, you're literally hanging. Right. You're going to fall to your death. What do you do every day that has led you to be here today? What do you do? You're good. Um, the main thing I believe is, uh, I believe in what Hewlett and Packard had, the management by walking around MBWA. And probably one of the biggest challenges we have is pulling people together. We're made up of about eight different companies. We have our own leadership for each one of the companies. So there's natural silos that are built. Not all silos are bad. What you have to do is figure out how to make silos work with each other. So that's what I try to do more than anything else is to pull people together for a common vision, being able to go take what we have maybe in one company or one division and multiply it against what's going on in other ones. Beautiful. Now, Gail, entrepreneurs are starting their businesses every day because they love their they're in love with the idea, I can be my own boss, right? It's about 90% it, of it. About 90% of it, right. right? They may be talented, right? First and foremost, they have talent, yet they don't have skill from the entrepreneurial perspective. They don't know that they must wear the accounting hat, they must wear the marketing hat, they must work the, the financing hat, and every single hat that goes along with it. And if you're not wearing hats, then you've missed the point. And this is where I believe that a lot of entrepreneurs fail is because of that. They don't sharpen the saw. They don't gain the additional skills that they need to gain. Mm -hmm. Or they don't have the right team like you have in mm -hmm. this respect. Tell me about your experience. What would you say to a new entrepreneur before they jump out, that aspiring entrepreneur, and if they've already taken that right. leap, let me know what you would tell them to do as a result of your learnings. I totally agree with you. In fact, uh, we take all the different functions down here in this company and various companies, and there are 31 functions. And most people will start out with one function or maybe two. So it might be, you know, they have a heck of an idea, or maybe they're good at software or something. But uh, it's really hard to have all these different functions. I think no matter what it is that you have, you're going to have to know how to sell. Uh, have a great product, have a great service. You will never be able to get off the ground if you can't sell, if you can't get over your fear of selling. And it's something that I think a successful entrepreneur has to know how to do themselves. It really can't be relegated in the beginning. Tell me about sales because that's the one thing I hear from all entrepreneurs. Right. They're afraid of sales. They're afraid of marketing. They're afraid of a lot of different things. Those are the two common things. What does sales really mean? Should I go open up a book? Am I logging on the internet and getting onto a course? What do you recommend in terms of sales? Um, I don't really understand a whole lot of online products. I did try to uh, have a website and make a million or a billion dollars like everybody else did. Really? In 30 days? No, well, did you get this, it? This would have been you know, like in 1999 where we were all going to be rich. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's only, you know, some tiny fraction of 
1% of 1% that actually made it work. And so far, I don't have enough sense to understand how you can take a website in these days or an app and turn it into money. Um, so I, I'm missing that. I'm, I'm, only, I'm only able to work with things where mm -hmm. there's substance. Let me ask, it sounds like you have a question. Uh, well, I was going to suggest that um, when you talk about sales when, and, the, and entrepreneurship and, and that beginning, because you were in sales before you started your business, um, and, then, and then how did you do that from, it was like the basement of your house. Right. Where you were making cold calls. I mean, maybe, maybe start from there. Right. I'd love to hear more of the person-to-person -person interaction. I get emails all the time, email marketing. If you, cannot, if you don't have enough sense to pick up the phone and ask me for my business, right. to even connect with me, to right. get to even know who right. I am, versus I met you at a networking event, you should buy my product. Right. First and foremost, no. <laughs> What's the connection there? What is the connection? <laughs> or you should attend my event. And I've heard people who go out and send out an email blast and they get one or two responses and say, well, we're canceling the event because it didn't work out. Well, why didn't it work out? Mm. Well, we sent out the blast and only two, we only had two responses. Did you consider picking up the phone? Did you consider right. meeting with people? Did you consider leveraging mm -hmm. your resources and your networks? How's that working out for you? Because if you're building it in this day and age, it, it technology does not, it, need yeah. to stifle us. You expect that email invite right. to, to accomplish it, it all. It is, it is more than that. It is more of a relationship mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of it. If I like you, mm -hmm. I, I really don't care if you know how to do the work. I if agree. I like you, I know I'll trust that you will figure it out. That's it. That's what's important to me, right? I agree. Can I trust you enough to go through this entire process and do this dance or whatever it is. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about sales from the way you started out of your basement. Well, I was pretty typical. Uh, I didn't like my boss. I didn't like the boss before that. I thought I was smarter than everybody else. You're the typical narcissistic entrepreneur, uh, which I think you have to have a little of that. And I did have a pretty strong sales background, but I, I went to Red Rocks Community College and I learned how to run a Wang word processor. So I went to college all these years, didn't learn a thing, got a little bit motivated, built all my tariffs, built all my stuff, built all this stuff, kind of going through the motions. And then uh, sat by the phone for eight days, just paralyzed. And, and this is somebody that knows how to sell. But when it came actually, you know, to promoting my product and having the nerve to go out there and stumble or whatever. It was amazing how I resisted that for mm -hmm. eight days. Then I started going out and, uh, and very lucky because I did have a few old contacts and then started getting something the next day. I think we got one shipment out of Gillette, Wyoming. Next day we got another one out of Gillette. The next day we started getting stuff from Mountain Bell, U.S. West, and we never ever got skunked ever since then but it really took getting off my rear end and and uh and must mustering up all the nerve that i had and i'm a salesman right. and i was scared and, and you speak of that that is so important gail so many of us are stuck i've been there mm -hmm. you've been there how do you get unstuck that that is the question of the century how does an entrepreneur get unstuck out of their own head because most of the time we have all the time energy money re in, even if we don't have all the time time energy right. money and resources we have skill and we have access to knowledge how do we put it to work mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. go in hire the most amazing consultant over here who teaches us how to perform in public whatever and yet we don't do it what do you think happens then how can somebody get themselves unstuck in that perspective. I think they have to make the move themselves. This cannot be delegated. Mm. You know, unless you have a team, unless you have a lot of financing, what in the beginning where you've got a division of labor where different people can do different things. But if you're a typical startup and you have a wonderful idea and you have ten or twenty thousand dollars or whatever, uh, you're gonna run out of money if you're not driving this thing yourself. You mean Gail that I cannot come wave my magic wand on you and you're going to become this amazing sales rock star person oh you could because you have all the charm in the world but, <laughs> right. the, but the ordinary I, uh, person i am pretty charming right, right? Yeah. oh my god <laughs> it makes a world of difference 
<laughs> it does make a world of difference. It does. It does. You know, charm and a good line goes a long way. Right. Being, right. Li- being likable and you know you're brazen. You're you have a lot of courage. You've got a good personality. You're not going to quit. You're you're very uh, innovative. You recognize opportunities. All the things that I'm seeing from knowing you a little bit and you being here today shows me you're a hardcore entrepreneur, and that you can teach people how to do a better job. You're pretty damn good, if I might Thank say you. that. I probably can't. You, you just have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's on video. <laughs> you got to edit that out. <laughs> here, here, here's the word darn. Darn, 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 darn. Pick one of those and paste it in. Loop it out. Right. right. <laughs> Loop it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So tell me, Gil, what are the steps for an entrepreneur? right now who is in the midst of hey we made it through year one what would you recommend for that person if you had this magic formula here are the five or ten steps that you must take in order for you to become even more successful and make it through those first five years what would you tell them um one of the people i really have a lot of respect for is scott adams who does dilbert Mm, and, and, and so he says that um, every time you have a skill set and you can pick up another skill set or maybe another one, then you increase your chances. So that's exactly what you and I talked about before. You know, he went to business school. He wasn't particularly uh, gifted when it came to business. He just barely passed or he might even flunked out. I'm not sure. And then he's an artist, but not a very good one. So that's why he's got the little line drawings. And then he's got a sense of humor, but it's not particularly funny. This is in, <laughs> in, in, this, this is in his words. This is in his words. But he says so that when you build on your strengths. So right. you build, build on your strengths and get more strengths. Right. The other thing that he talks about, and I really believe in this, is to get everything that you can visual. So, you know, let's say it's the end of the year. Just start making a PowerPoint mm-hmm. and do it again and do it again. And every time you read, every time you get an idea, every time you have a failure, Keep accumulating this so this is almost the story of your life or the story of your business or the things that you've learned. And do it every day. And you'll be absolutely amazed at what will start cleaning itself up, what kind of ideas will pop in, what kind of magic there is, just because you're doing this consistently. And there's all kinds of people talk about this. You know, Covey, start with the end in mind. Uh, You become what you think about. Uh, visualize things, you know, write it down, look in the mirror, uh, the have mantras. Effects. But I think there is a little bit of magic that aligns your brain. And there might even be more magic that aligns your luck. Not quite sure how that one works. And I think that's magic because it's on a subconscious level here. And I can go into mantras. But I love my mala. I talk about mantras of the entrepreneur. I think I've been doing mantras Mm. since I was five years old. And that's what's led me here today. I know we're about to close up here. Nope, you've got a little time left. Okay, all right. Um, I I think you're just starting to crack them open. Are we starting just to crack them open? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, there's more inside. I just know it. You know there's more inside? There's a gooey center. There is a gooey center? Mm -hmm. Really? I'm waiting for it. What question do you think we should be asking him? Oh, let's see. Um... Gail's the, just wondering. He's like, "What are oh they no, going? I, I, to I, happen I, now? What are they going to come I've, up I've, with?" I've been in court a few times, so this <laughs> is not too bad. This is not too bad. <laughs> right. I know there's this mushy, mushy I center think there. That, um, you know, you you have asked, and I think he's evaded it. Like, the, yes, the, I have. How, <laughs> he does a good job. He's, I told you he'll evade. But that that support system you've had has has really been your family, and I know that. Um, because, you know, when we talk about you starting in your basement, it was just you and your wife, Karen, right. making those phone calls and getting it started tell, and, and more family diving in. Tell me more about that, because I know that's so important for me at, from an entrepreneurial perspective, having that support, whatever that was. For instance, when I had my friend that would come over and stay with my son because I was traveling as right. a single mother, there were so many key things. When you hit the wall, Gail that your wife picks you up, what, what does that look and it, like? And it probably wouldn't be your wife because they get sick of this real fast. Do they really get sick of it? Oh, I'm pretty Shake sure. Shake you up and, a and little I think, bit. And I think this goes both ways. So, you know, at first, yeah, you have a vested interest in bellyaching and whining and trying to sort things out. 
But it doesn't take very long for that to get old. So what you need is a best friend. Okay. And, uh, and a best friend can take it and probably be more honest and not get as sick of it as fast as your mate will. Right, because they're living in there day in and day out. They well, you're know. playing different roles, you know. So right. they, you, you know, need should a be break your, from it. Should be your wife and not your shrink, you know. Right, right. I think that's a great place to to step off right now for the break and dive right back into that question when we come back. Wonderful. We'll be back with more with Gail Deniger, who's in the interrogation seat with <laughs> <laughs> with Rocio Perez, and I can't wait to hear more. Stick with us. Thanks so much for, for staying with us for Connect and Collaborate. We're talking with Rocio Perez. She's uh, got Gail in the hot seat today. Gail Deniger, the founder of Cap Logistics, and I can't wait to hear this, this uh, develop. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, Gail. I mean, this is a wonderful relationship. It's kind of a sadomasochistic type of, you know, and. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, you know, right? And, and, it's and the and best I, of both worlds. And I like being masochistic. You so do. just, you know, just to hurt me as much as you can. <laughs> now, Gail, we were just talking. Just, we were talking just a moment ago about your support system and that you can't really put it all on your wife. That you must have that best friend that you can bounce your ideas off of and whatever's going on in your life. Tell me more about that. About my best friend? Yeah, tell me more about that experience with your best friend. What are the type of things that you decide to tell your wife versus your best friend? Who are you downloading what? Because you can't don't let it download yeah. all into one. I think one. when you're talking to your wife or your mate or whatever, you should have to be about 80% positive. That doesn't mean that you can't get an opinion someplace. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to have uh, somebody that when it is really nasty, really scary, uh, you don't know what to do emotionally. You're having a tough time. Uh, that has to be somebody besides your wife or your husband or whatever the case might be. Um, the person that I re refer to um, is the person that if I was in a foxhole, I'd want this person beside me, uh, charging machine gun nest, very, very, very tough, very clear-headed, uh, compliments, uh, you know, I have a lot of imagination and a lot of vision, so this person's a real hardcore executor, the Six Sigma, leave no prisoners, lean, but much more. You know, not, not just, you know, the trends right now. There's a lot more to somebody that can really get things done than, than the latest trend or the latest book, and this person's got all that. Wonderful. It almost sounds like my brother. He said, really? if there's one phone call that I would have to make at any given point in time, and that's just one, it would be to my sister. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be to my wife. It would be to no one except for my sister. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, could work. You know, there's not quite the same, right, the same relationship there. Right, in a different sense. Now, Gail, speaking of things that can go wrong, because we cannot foresee the future right. into everything. You've done this so many times. What were some of the things that you had not foreseen in your career as you were developing these businesses mm. that you, you hit that wall and you're like, okay, what happened? Tell me that moment. Once again, I'm probably, you know, like the, the real problems or whatever, I'm probably not going to uh, talk about. They're probably uh, too close to home. Right, right. Give me some. But, uh, um, let me answer it this way, and, and I'm not trying to be evasive while I'm trying to be evasive. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> he does have one level. You, like, you like only that. have one level, okay? <laughs> Is this why he's sitting so far <laughs> apart from us? He's worried <laughs> you're going to recognize two levels of evasive. But he's right. only working okay. with one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I mean, I'm his for translator. In, we'll, for, we'll take one. <laughs> for instance, I've got uh, five different backup plans. I feel like I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm exactly. waiting to hear all these amazing things that are coming out. They're, they're just, you know. Um, so when I've got five plans, A, B, C, D, E, you know, there's, so you got your plan A when things are going well, and you have your plan B, which is a backup, and those are the ones that you do when things are going pretty well, and then your so-so one, and then different forms of complete disaster. And uh, um, once again, I think that by going through and updating all this, I, I use OneNote, and I've probably got enough stuff in OneNote that might fill 100 books. And so that's my own. I think we share something in common. Mm. Yeah, and so, you know, I always go back there and research. Problems can't always find 
what it is that you put in there. You don't tag it right. But I think it's amazing how, you know, you're in a situation, I'm in a situation where you can read an article, you can go to school, you can listen to an author, you can do all these things and actually go out and apply it, which is totally different than trying to take these things and say, well, I have enough now to go start a business. Uh -huh. Way, way, way easier to go have something that you've already lived through and then multiply it and make it better than to go in there in the first place and try to make something work from scratch. Most definitely. I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurs fall on their face, right? They want to go ahead and just take knowledge. They don't do anything with the knowledge. They jump out, literally, without right. even a life vest, into mm -hmm. the water and attempt to make that business a multi-million dollar business overnight, mm -hmm. when at the end of the day, success is a lot of small things done right. Mm. And success is 20 years in the coming, right? It is not something that happened. Pretty good number, right? It wasn't overnight. I didn't come up with the network or the people or the business right. or whatever overnight. And you know that better than I do. Right. The whole relationship building, the learning, the applying, the doing day in and day out and, and attempting to recreate it. So what do they say? Test, track, tweak, do it again, listen. Mm. First and mm -hmm. foremost, what's happening? Ready, fire, aim. Right. right, right, in so many different respects. So I think that there is an unrealistic expectation that we all have. It starts when you're in college. So you have certain kids that go in there and they really, really, really study, and they take hard stuff like engineering and whatever, and then you have a bunch of people that might go in there and take poli-sci and, and uh, you know, some of the, the other type of, of uh, courses, and then they hope for the best when they get out, but they really don't see any kind of cause and effect. Um, and, and so, you know, they're just hoping for the best. They're hoping that when I graduate from college that something wonderful happens. Don't quite know how it's going to work. So most of these people, like you've got placement offices in, in the, uh, you know, in, in the administration building, whatever the case might be, and very few of these kids will take advantage of anything when you have all these teachers, all these instructors, all these people, all these people with experience trying to help them out, and they're just kind of relying on magic. Uh, same thing is every person thinks that they're going to hit a home run, or at least they're hoping for that. And I like to go use the analogy of a football game. And you go look at the Broncos, I think that stadium holds 76,000 people. Well, half the people in there think they're going to make $100 million. How many people do you think, literally out of that 75 or 76,000 people, will actually make the $100 million that every other person thinks they're going to? So there's a huge disconnect. There is a huge disconnect because a lot of people are not taught, and you're, you're right, Gail, a lot of students don't know how to put two and two together. They don't know how to do the relationship, look at how these things are working out. How do I apply it to real life? How do mm -hmm. I really ingrain that learning? There's one thing between, there's a difference between knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Absolutely. I learned it in the book. I understand it because I've lived it. I get it. And I have wisdom because not only do I get it, now I'm teaching it. Right, if you can get to that point. If you can get to that point. And that there's a major difference between management and leadership. You can manage all these things around right. all you want. You can't manage people the way that we manage that way. Now let's talk about leadership because leadership is so important with that respect, Gail and especially that internal leadership. I must learn how to lead myself before I can lead others. I truly believe that unless we know who we are, what blocks us, what limits us, we cannot have even greater success. I agree. Tell me more about your style of leadership and what it's taken for you to be where you're at. <laughs> it is some form of lazy fare. You know, a little bit of, of keeping your hands off. So I'm not somebody that wants to go in there and manage every detail. That's not my DNA. So I'm fairly intuitive. This goes along with being left-handed, right-brained. So part of those characteristics, you can see the big picture. You can see how things fit together. And you're fairly intuitive when you're talking to people. So it's the lazy, fair type thing. So that means you have to have really, really good people around you. Um, and a lot of times, you know, and it doesn't come 
from a lot of these interviews or a lot of these tests. You know, there, you can get a test right now for almost anything. Mm -hmm. And so to have this thing literally on a test, you know, lying to go this way or go that way or whatever is not the whole answer. There is part of, of what you're doing, whether you're selling, whether you're hiring somebody, whether you're leading people, managing people, whatever, which is just understanding people. So for the most part, hire good people, tell them what you want, give them the room, give them support, uh, and, uh, and get together every so often to see how you're aligning. Uh, part of the problem when you have a very, very strong personality, almost every person we have in this company is some sort of a hyper A, some sort of an alpha wolf. You know, and so I'm an old alpha wolf. We have a lot of uh, young alpha wolves. And that's always real interesting because everybody always thinks they have the best idea. And whenever you're going to have conflict, it's primarily going to come from the fact that you do not agree on a concept or on an idea. So that's where the fun is. So probably by not being quite so lazy fair or just plain lazy, that maybe some of this could be developed a little bit more tightly in the beginning so that it wouldn't be a problem in round two. But I don't have the energy to do it right. So. Mm -hmm. So you mean it is, from a leadership perspective, it is not wise to come in and impose your own ideas on others and this is the way it is. If you don't like it, it's the highway, my way or the highway? That doesn't work? I think you can do that a little. You know the answer to this. <laughs> You're tricking me. Yeah, I mean, people, everybody. It's my job. Every, everybody, everybody wants to have a dream. Everybody wants to be important. Everybody wants to, you know, create their own destiny. So I don't think you can go in there and kill it for people right away. Now, there's a certain point where, you know, you work with people and you direct and you lead and you manage and whatever the case may be. But that is just to get things started. Uh, after that, then these people have to flourish on their own. Some people can. Some people can flourish and they're, they're fine working in a team. And there's some people that are, you know, not only, you know, that are lone wolves. You know, they're not just the alpha male. They're, they're a lone wolf. So it's really interesting when you're dealing with lone wolves. How can you create an infrastructure? How can you create opportunities? How can you have enough resources? How can you, you know, have enough in there to go keep everybody happy? The same people that you bring in that will be your most valuable people are the ones that are going to cause you the most problem because they have the most independence and they have the highest opinion of themselves. So it's kind of the balance between you know, strong personalities, uh, people behaving themselves. So, I mean, we have some people down here that want absolute undying uh, love and respect and obedience, not really so interested in productivity, you know, interested in people behaving themselves. You know, I don't really care if people behave themselves as much as can you produce and uh, can you do something or bring something to the table that nobody else brings. Long answer, I apologize. It's okay. Speaking of resources, because mm -hmm. I think this is one key, one important thing. We know we can't get rid of people, right? Because they, everybody brings something important to the table. Right. And when we can understand them individually for their contributions and give Absolutely. them that space to be who they are, or else we're going to be going down the road, firing people, hiring someone the same problems will arise right? unless we understand ourselves, unless we understand how this person works and how they can best work with right. themselves and within the team. Now, speaking of resources, starting up a business, can I just open sure. up a website, go on Fiverr, create my brand? Sure. And go ahead. It all go ahead works. and do it. Tell me about it. I think you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about that because we're we're speaking not only of spaghetti marketing, right. we're really going into tic tac toe strategy at the end of the day, right? We don't have a defined strategy, a whole market branding where our kid is creating our logo and we're expecting to be successful. Mm. You know, and the kid is 10 years old. What in the world do they know about how do you develop a world-class mm. brand? Right. Let me, let me start there. Tell me about your experience for that entrepreneur who may have already done that or maybe the ones that are thinking of doing that. Where's the greatest bang for your buck? Well, that's a compound question and very complicated. I know. I'm See, I'm not, <clears throat> I think there's a tremendous amount of self-serving hype 
out there. And so, you know, you have people that would say I had, you know, I've got, uh, you know, 2,000 friends on Facebook. And, uh, you know, I wrote an article and the thing was opened up, you know, 93 times and it was forwarded one time or whatever. So people are placing emphasis on metrics that mean absolutely nothing because they heard someplace that, uh, you know, it, it does mean something. I think no matter what it is, whether it's software, or whether it is social media, many, many other things, I believe that there's one person out of a thousand that really understands the power of whatever it is, software or marketing or whatever the case may be. There's a whole bunch of other people think that if they do it, they will come or that, you know, if they do this and somehow magic, uh, you know, will happen. So what is, what is your measure? Because for me, is the money in the bank? That is a measure of that success. That certainly would be, yeah, I mean, you're right. going to have to, yeah, that longevity, longevity. Longevity. Which is dependent upon money in the bank. Right. And, and are the clients knocking on my door or am I knocking on every single door over and over again? Well, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, you know, you're hopefully, doing both. Exactly. Because it, for me, marketing is a thing that you do all the time, every time, right. no matter where you're at. Right. You're always selling. I mean, we've been selling since the beginning of our birth, right? Our entire life. Oh, my God. A little baby it, or a, a yeah. three-year-old kid, best salesman in the world. <laughs> has, has, I get that. Has nothing and can manipulate and talk everybody in and use emotional and blackmail and <laughs> oh my god a three-year-old kid's wonderful i see my grandson right now who is shy a couple of weeks of being three years old and he looks at me with that look and i turn around and I look at him, that's not going to work with me, honey. Mm -hmm. Right. I understand human behavior mm -hmm. way too well right. for that to work. In reality, when you talk about manipulation, when you talk about, for me, a two-year-old, that's been my saying. Mm -hmm. I think we, we play We're off, of each, off of each other on that. We're a year off of each other, right. Right. We do play off of each other. That two-year-old has much more power than a 40-year-old who, at the end of the day, is either interested or they're committed. To me, that two-year-old is committed. They want that toy. They yeah. want to do something. They will go. They will go down. I mean, they will cry. They will manipulate. Right. They will do whatever. They will go to. Well, bed, there's no shame. Whatever. There's they, no dignity. There's no. <laughs> there's no nothing. Right. That entrepreneur gets told no once or twice, right. and all of a sudden they're out. The, well, nobody called me. Well, right. guess what? You didn't try hard enough. You you were trying. Let's let's rephrase that. You were trying. You were not committed to your mm. idea. And you didn't really want to bring it to fruition, or else it would be here. Let's be realistic. I don't care how many mountains you need to climb. It is your mountains in your mind that you must first climb. So my grandson's three years old. And the other day he comes to my wife and he goes, well, tell me why I can't have any ice cream. So he's already worked through the first part of this where he knows they're going to say no. And he's to the second step already. That's mm -hmm. pretty good. That's pretty brilliant. <laughs> That's pretty and brilliant. I will shoot down your theories. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just fascinating, right? Because children can teach us a lot. Mm -hmm. For me, business is like a family. It works very similar. There must be communication. Mm -hmm. There must be commitment. There must be loyalty. There must be all these different components in order for that business to thrive, to be successful. And every respect of the word. What are your insights on that? What do you relate business to? Uh, the first thing I, I relate business to are more or less games. Um, you know, I talked before about some of these metaphors. So talking about the spider once again, so that's really a game board. So, you know, you've got design, you flatten the thing out, and you've got rings and radii and so on. Um, and then the next part uh, of the game, or the resources, uh, as I was talking about the B. Uh, so all games have a board. All games have resources, money, cannons, uh, you know, whether it's risk, monopoly, chess, whatever the case may be. And then the third thing they have is a set of rules. How do you play the game? Uh, and then you learn how to play the game. You go to school to play the game. You get a law degree to play the game, you get an MBA to play the game, and once you learn how to play the game, 
then you play it better than somebody else. If you keep doing it better than somebody else, you'll actually make it. If you do it continually better than somebody else, then eventually uh, you might stay in business. So my most simple description is it's a game. Now, if you're playing with chess, if you go take the back row, you got a king, a queen, whatever the case may be, you have all this talent, then the trick is how can everybody go after the same objective? You know, is the objective checkmate of the other side? If you can do that, then you probably have a good chance, you know, learn how to play better. But, you know, games, whether it's politics, whether it's a courtroom, whether it's war, whether it's business, whatever, they're all games. Now, tell me, Gil, in your final closing here in the next couple of minutes, executive briefings are very important, right? How would you brief me? I'm an entrepreneur, aspiring entrepreneur, whatever. I'm about to make my next step. If you had two minutes to brief me on what I can do in order to become even more successful right. or ensure my success, what would you tell me? I'd probably try to find out right away where you think you might need help. So I'm not really a consultant and don't really have enough time to spend a whole lot of time with you. You know, in most cases, so where do you think you would need help? You know, just uh, from a hypothesis here. And then maybe I could help you there. Okay, so you would start from that perspective. I think maybe that's maybe a form of laziness again. <laughs> right. Okay, so laziness from the perspective of the entrepreneur who wants all the quick fix approach? Because yeah, it doesn't exist, does it? Am I not supposed to open it on one of those social media, the top 10 things, follow right. this, yeah. and you will be successful overnight, you will be making 1.2 million <laughs> in the next three months. you won't be successful until you click through this page three right. times, right? Click, 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 <laughs> pay this, pay right. that. Well, guess who's making the money as right. a person, right? Mm -hmm. So we uh, had Thomas Friedman as a speaker for a, Who's absolutely for, phenomenal. For a STEM summit. And you know, he's written these incredible books, uh, The World is Flat. Yes. And I really went in and analyzed The World is Flat. So it's really two pieces. One is that there's a lot of things that technology bring to the table. And the other part of it is networks. So if you can go put those two things together, then you start to be able to go flat in the world, I guess, compared to competitors. He's a tremendous showman. You know, and when you're listening to him, you're going, my God, you know, this is so much fun. So he's there singing and dancing and talking and, and it has everybody all wrapped in, in listening to him. Just like we do. And then, right and now then, we're right. like and sitting then, here. <laughs> and, then, and then at one point, he stops for two or three seconds and he says, you know, it's all, I don't know what I can say and not say, it's all uh, BS. And then he thought for another couple mm. seconds, and then he went back and he's doing his song and dance, whatever. And I think that's the problem is that there is so much information and so many people making it look like they know what they're doing and all these consumers out there that want to be led and you know, all these entrepreneurs that want to go find this magic elixir, the magic statement, the magic words, that they're just a complete overload of information and, you know, you're getting the information from somebody that's also trying to make a living. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that they know what they're talking about. They're just going through and, and uh, you know, seeking they're testing, information. They're tweaking, tweaking their approach. Right. Yeah, they're, they? so they're, they're, they're stealing from somebody and, and repurposing re it. So I heard one place that there has not been an original thought since Babbage in about 1860 created some form of a computer. So then everything else is a combination of, you know, adding to it. So, you know, once again, I think you have to rely on yourself and not think that somebody else is going to be giving you that magic answer. They can coach a little bit. What they probably can do is make you think. Right. But eventually, you have to do it yourself. You have to call the shots. You can't blame somebody else. Somebody can help, but it's up to you. Beautiful. Beautiful. What a privilege. Yeah. I feel so <laughs> enlightened. It's, it's wonderful to hear it from a rock star entrepreneur who has built it, who's had it. It's here. You're moving it forward. And thank you for sharing your insights, your wisdom with the world. Back at you. I met my match today. You met That's your match. Sure. Yeah, and, and it was fun. Thank you. Thank it's you for having privilege. the insight to take advantage of Tammy's show.
Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much. Yes, yes, Rosa. Rocio Perez, thank you so much for helping interrogate Gail a little bit. He doesn't get this near enough. And, and Gail Deniger, uh, founder of Cap Logistics and, and uh, Cap Worldwide and Alliance and how many other businesses. So. And the phone's ringing. I should have turned my phone off. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today on Connect and Collaborate, where we come together each day to introduce you to our network of business and community leaders.